Ephesians chapter 4. We've noted and we'll probably remind you again that the book of Ephesians breaks down as a number of Paul's uh, letters do to the doctrinal section and then the application of that doctrine. And that's true in Ephesians. The first three chapters are primarily doctrinal. And then with chapters 4, 5, and 6, you move to the application of that doctrine. Uh, comes with an emphasis on the word walk. Uh, now, he mentioned walking back in chapter 2, verse 2, in fit, which you formerly walked when you were dead in your trespasses and sins, but now, as a result of us being his workmanship, verse 10 of chapter 2, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which the God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. But he was laying the doctrinal foundation for that walk in those first three chapters. Then with chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. So he reminds them of uh, the work of God in their redemption, that they were called uh, to God in salvation. Now walk in a manner worthy of that calling. Walk in a manner, conduct your life consistently with what you are, what you are now as one who has been called in Christ, made new, and now are to walk in good works, the good works which God prepared beforehand that we would walk in them, as Ephesians 2.10 said. So now walk in a manner worthy of the calling. And that's a progressive thing. Uh, it, we're never done. We've never arrived at that perfection that he has for us in Christ. But we are growing. And we continue to grow. And that's what we uh, study the word for. It's a nourishment for our new life in Christ. And we progressively become more conformed to him. So uh, down in verse 17, he uh, talked about what it meant. And he really summarized the doctrine in verses uh, 1 to 16 of chapter 4. Uh, reminding us how we are enabled to walk by God's grace. He has made us new and he has gifted us. Each individual believer is gifted. He mentioned some of those gifts in verse 11, uh, which were foundational for the rest of the other gifts to function as God intends. For the equipping of the saints, verse 12, for the work of serving to the building up of the body of Christ. Now, what will the body of Christ look like now? In verse 17, I say, this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer like you used to walk. The Ephesian church is primarily a Gentile church, as our church is, as the church today generally is. I mean, they're not believing Jews, but he's primarily working in the Gentile world and building his church today. Uh, there are Jews that are saved, but they're a minority in number. Uh, just as in the Old Testament, God was working with the nation Israel, but there were Jews that were saved. And we've talked about that. Verse 17, we walk no longer as the Gentiles also walk, because they walk in the emptiness, the futility of their mind. They don't have uh, the capacity. They don't have the ability. They're not thinking straight. And so progressively, they just drift further and further away. They're darkened in their understanding. Verse 18 said they're excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. That's why we don't become actively involved in any real and serious way in political issues that really don't have the foundation of a relationship with God. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't agree more with a certain political position than another political position, but basically they're all coming from the same place of ignorance. When you get down to the bottom line, 
They're not driven by their relationship with God and what he has said and how they are to live as people now conform to the image of his son who is our savior. So verse 22, we were in reference to our former manner of life, you lay aside the old life because the verse 20, you did not learn Christ in this way that you lived your life driven by your own desires and they fluctuate they vary we get frustrated with our own country as we see it drift more and more to what we would call liberalism Um, but basically we're just seeing more open display of what has been the condition of the heart from the beginning because you have to start at the beginning I need to be made new within by Christ and then live without Now, again, we live in a fallen world and we vote and so on according to general principles. But we don't want to lose our perspective and get so caught up. Boy, if we could just change the political dimension here, we would change the whole court. No, we wouldn't. And we as the church are here to bring a special message, a message of life. So you did not learn Christ in this way, verse 20. Indeed, if you've heard of him and you have, And you've been taught in him just as truth is in Jesus. So the truth is related to Christ and his work on the cross for us. That's foundational to everything. In reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, literally the old man. Uh, We have the old self that gives you the idea, the old man, what you were until Christ made you new. So that's everyone, the most conservative politically, is still an old man unless he has been made new in his heart by Christ. So in reverence to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old man which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. What we are to do as God's people, now we've placed our faith in Christ, we are no longer what we were. We've been made new within. That's the key, within. We've been made a new man, a new person. We're not what we were, so we would not, should not continue to practice those things. That's what he's uh, talking about when he talks about uh, our walk in verse 17, that you walk no longer as the Gentiles also walk. Um, they walk in the emptiness of their mind. They don't have understanding. That's what we were. We have reference. We understand that because we had the former manner of life. Now, perhaps you were saved when you were young by God's grace and you haven't had that much of the old life, but you still recognize the distinction and the difference that is there and are to live in light of that difference. It's being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. We see our country. Perhaps it started more biblically, but over time it becomes more unbiblical, more openly unbiblical. The commitment to biblical principles was rather superficial. Give it time and it reveals itself. So it's being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceits. So that's what we were. Now we are to be being renewed. We noted, uh, you go from the aorist tense that notes the past generally, what we were, to a present tense, you being renewed, and then we'll go back to the past because you've put on the new self. Yeah, going back to the aorist tense in verse 24. You put on the new self, which, is be, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness, holiness of the truth. Righteousness, holiness, and truth. But that's only when you're made new in Christ. So I want to stress that because we as believers, if we're not careful, we get so entangled in the political dimension of things It was true in Paul's day. There was more that were consistent with the Bible, that were inconsistent, and we we have the right to vote. So we vote with that which is more consistent 
I'm not saying we don't do that. But we don't become so entangled, we think if we do that, we'll begin to change the country. We won't. God is sovereign. And we know where all things are moving because we've read the book and studied it together, the book of Revelation. And all things are going to collapse in themselves when the church is removed and God finally brings about the destruction of this world and the establishing of God's kingdom. So you put on the new self, the new man, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness, holiness, the truth. That's, you know, get the distinction here. You've been created new in righteousness, holiness of the truth. Righteousness, holiness, and truth are to be characteristic of those who are truly made new in Christ. Um, otherwise, you're the old person. And uh, that's fine. That's the reality we live in. And because we have a right to vote and have our influence there felt, we want to be careful. We don't, sometimes I uh, look at Christians and I think, well, boy, they've become so part of the world system. It's like Christianity won't survive if uh, we don't change this world. But you have to be made new. And that's a personal, individual change. Going to church doesn't bring it about. Going to church where the truth is proclaimed gives you an opportunity to hear the truth and believe it and be changed within. But you can attend church, live and die having attended a Bible-believing church and go to eternal hell because it's a personal relationship established by personal faith in Christ. So having laid aside the old self, being made new in the spirit of our mind, Having put on the new man, it's been created in God. The difference is night and day. I mean, how do you say it? Um, we were the old man, now we're the new man. That's the difference we want to bring to the world. Uh, political issues... We're blessed to be in a country where we still have the freedom to meet and so on. I appreciate that. But I don't want them to begin to equate things that are not uh, consistent with each other. So verse 25, Therefore, as those who have laid aside the old person you were, been made, created new in Christ, and so are being made new in the spirit of your mind, verse 25, Therefore, in light of these truths, laying aside falsehood. Um, laying aside. That's the same word we had in verse 22. Laying aside the old self. Same word. Uh, as we have in English, uh, same word in Greek. You lay aside the old man. You lay aside falsehood. You've been made new in Christ. Romans 6 gives the fullest development of this. Just turn to Romans 6 for a moment, if you would. Romans chapter 6. And it talks about the old man that we were and the new man that we are. Um, verse 6, chapter 6 opens up. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may increase? May it never be. How we are we who died to sin be able to continue to live in it. There's something wrong in your thinking if you think, well, I placed my faith in Christ, now I get on with my life. No, I start to live a new life. And if you're not living a new life, you've never been made new. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? I mean, it's a question that, you know, there's only one answer. It's impossible. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ, he's talking about their spirit baptism, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. By one spirit, we have all been baptized into one body. Our water baptism is to be a public testimony that we have been made new in Christ. But water baptism in and of itself does nothing. Spirit baptism, the transformation of the person from the old person you were to the new person you are. 
And so uh, it all took place, verse 4, the end of the verse, so that we might walk, there's our word walk that we are talking about in Ephesians, in newness of life. So that now we've been changed by being identified with Jesus Christ through faith in him, his death on our behalf, his burial, his resurrection to a new life. When I place my faith in Christ, I am identified with him spiritually. I am made new. I'm not the old person. There's things I still do. I may live in the same house, drive the same car, wear the same clothes. But me as a person, I am new. So God did this, made us new, so we would walk in a different way. So now I get on with my life and just live like I lived. Well, I may still go to work, do the same job, wash the same dishes, clean the same house, do... But I am doing it with a different motivation. I am a new person. We might walk in newness of life. If we have become, verse 5, united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we will be in the likeness of his resurrection. That just divides it out. It's not whether you attend Indian Hills Community Church or not. You can attend here and live like the devil. It's when you're made new, now you live a new life. Uh, you don't live and conduct yourself in the old way. We have become united with him in the likeness of his death. We will be in the likeness of his resurrection. Spiritually, I have become identified with Christ. When he died, I died. I'm a new person by faith in Christ. And he who has died, our old man, verse 6, that we're talking about in Ephesians, Knowing this, our old self, our old man was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with. Our body is controlled by sin, motivated by sin, by the selfishness of sin. It's all about me. There's a transformation that takes place. So we would no longer be slaves to sin for he who has died is freed from sin. It's crucial to understanding Ephesians. It's crucial to understanding the Bible that we understand this truth. If you've been made new in Christ, you are a new person. Well, I'm living like the old, but I, I, I know I've trusted Christ. Um, the Bible doesn't allow for that. And with a good reason, not, well, we want to be the judge of everyone no, but we want to be realistic. If your life has not changed, you have not been made new. Oh, well, I'm just... No. Uh, verse 8, if we have died with Christ, we believe we will also live with him. And the Bible's clear. There is a transformation that takes place. You are made new when you place your faith in Christ. You are not the old person. Now there's growth. But the desire has changed. The motivation of your thinking, your heart, it's different now than it was. Um, if we're not clear on that, then we just begin. Everybody, yeah, you come to church, you try to be a good person, you do good things, we're good people. We're doing fine. Uh, we don't want to miss the foundational truths. Christ died. Death is no longer master over him. Verse 9. Uh, verse 10. The death that he died, he died to sin once for all. The life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves dead to sin. That doesn't mean I never sin. But the desire is to live a life that's pleasing to God. And when I do sin, there's something there. I can't live here. I don't live here any longer. I'm not the old me. I'm a new person. Consider yourselves dead to sin, verse 11, but alive to God. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you obey its lust. Do not go on presenting the members of your body as instruments of unrighteousness. Present yourselves to God, verse 13. Ah. Uh, now I want to live for him. I want to please him. I want to serve him. Verse 22, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God. There's only two kinds of people 
present on earth. Those who are enslaved to sin, those who are enslaved to God. Well, I try to live, I, that's irrelevant. Now, again, I don't want to push and say, well, then, boy, I, I'm not perfect. I know I have, well, then, let's work on it. And that's true for our entire life. And no matter how long I've been a believer for over 50 years, but I'm still not perfect. I understand that. But the desire is there. That wasn't there before. The desire to know the word, to be in the word, to have the word impact my heart, to convict me, to change me, that I be new. Having been enslaved, verse 22, freed from sin, enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification, the outcome eternal life. The wages of sin is death. The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Just stop, uh, just before the book of Ephesians, stop at Galatians. We will get back to Ephesians. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. Now, what does this mean? That spiritual identification has taken place. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. And it's all by grace. I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. It's not just, oh, I'm going to clean up my life. I'm going to do better. I'm going to stop. You say, first, I'm going to settle this relationship with God. Place my faith in him and in Christ and his death to pay it all for me. And then I'm going to be a new person. I'm going to be in the word. I'm going to allow the spirit to begin to conform me to the word in my walk. So you come back to Ephesians chapter 4. The same thing as 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 where in man being Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. New things have come. It's just repeated throughout scripture. This is important. It's foundational. So verse 25, therefore, laying aside falsehood. And that same word uh, basically lay aside as we had up in verse 22. Lay aside the old self, the old man. And that means everything that's associated with that old man. So you're laying aside, verse 25, falsehood. So that's what we're talking about. We're not just, well, I'm going to concentrate more on telling the truth. Well, there may be an element of that, but basically I'm new. Truth is to characterize me. I'm about truth because verse 21, the end of the verse says, truth is in Jesus. The kind of truth we're talking about is found in Christ. And so I have to make sure above all that that relationship has been established. So then I can talk about laying aside falsehood. Because verse 22 says, I've laid aside the old self. So here, yes, I lay aside falsehood. Because everything connected with the old man, the rebellion, the resistance against God, the resistance against the truth of God and what he has made known. So now I lay aside falsehood. Um, falsehood is the things that characterize this world, that characterize the God, small g of this world, who is the devil. Come back to John chapter 8. It is an important section because Jesus deals with the religious people of his day in John chapter 8. And in verse 44, you are of your father the devil. He's talking to... Um, Jews and Jewish uh, leaders and he's saying verse 24 you're of your father the devil you want to do the desires of your father he was a murderer from the beginning he does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him now when you become new in Christ you lay aside falsehood falsehood the word for false there is the opposite of truth it's like we have so if it's something false it's not true if it's true, it's not false. 
Well, it's sort of, um, you know, a mixture. No, it's not. Um, so we lay aside a falsehood. Uh, there's no truth in the devil. And when the devil is your father, your spiritual uh, father, then there's no truth in him. No truth in him. Whatever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. The issue then, verse 47, he was of God, hears the words of God. For this reason you don't hear them, because you're not of God. That's simple. We don't want to hear what God has to say anymore. We've enjoyed your church, we're on to other things. Not that everybody goes, or some people have gone to another believing, Bible-believing church for whatever reason. But some people are going to sit here and say, you know, this just isn't for me. Because the truth isn't for them. Now maybe they're being moved by God to another place where the truth will be presented. And that's fine. But we want to be careful. Uh, you're of your father, the devil. Come over to 1 John. All the way toward the back of your New Testament. Almost to the book of Revelation. Just one little book, Peter. And then you're in the epistles of John. We want 1 John, not the gospel of John. 1 John, chapter 2, verse 21. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it. And no lie is of the truth. So there we have the standard. And the, God's word is truth. Your word is truth, Jesus said. In John 17, in his high priestly prayer. So if it's not according to this word, it's not truth. doesn't matter that a church teaches it. Is it biblical? The church ought to be teaching the truth. Again, we're not perfect, but we're growing. And we want to examine the word and discern, well, if this is true and we're not in conform to it, we need to make the change. We need to make an adjustment. Verse 27, while you're in John, uh, 1 John 2, as for you, the anointing which you received from him abides in you. You have no need for anyone to teach you. His anointing teaches you about all things and is true, is not a lie. And just as it is taught you, you abide in him. And now little children abide in him uh, because that's the position you have so that when he cries, you won't be put away from him in shame. Verse 29, you know, if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. So we're back to Ephesians chapter four, the practice of righteousness in contrast to that which is false. Uh, we think, well, at least they go to church. At least they're religious. No. Um, do they have a true, living, vital relationship with God? And a part of that is, do they care about the truth? Therefore, verse 25, laying aside falsehood, speak the truth, each one of you, with his neighbor. That's a quote from Isaiah chapter 8, verse 16. You have it set aside if you're using New American Standard in capital. Speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor. We won't turn there for now, uh, for time, but uh, Zechariah chapter 8, verse uh, 6, uh, is uh, the passage that's in view here, verse 16, uh, Zechariah eight sixteen. 16. Uh, it, this has been true for God's people. God, Israel made the transition. Well, we're going to keep the law. That'll do it. No, keeping the law was to be a result of having been changed in their heart. Made new by faith in the God who gave the word. They thought, well, I'll just try to keep, uh, I'll just try to be a good person, live the word, keep the law, and I'll be good to go. That's, no, uh, so the speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor. And that's true. The neighbor here is a fellow believer. Uh, doesn't mean we're to, we have the right to be untruthful with the world. But he's, con he's concerned about we start. We speak the truth with their neighbor because you are members of one another. 
Uh, we are members of one another. We're part of the body of Christ. Uh, chapter 2 of Ephesians talked about the gifts that were given and we are his workmanship in Christ Jesus. In chapter 4, uh, verse 11, so he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers. And 1 Corinthians 12 elaborates on the gifts and there are more than just these, but these are foundational gifts. So, yeah, that's where we are. We're members of one another. So there's the individual responsibility. There is the corporate responsibility. They are not distinct. They are the same as um, being members of your physical body. Well, yeah, the hand is the hand. And the fingers, they, they serve a part that's different than the eyes. But yet they are not separate and distinct because they work together. They work in harmony um, they are one body together. And that's what enables us to work in unity and harmony as a fellowship of believers. Uh, so we speak the truth to one another in love. Uh, we, we're members of one another. We're part. So yeah, we have our individual responsibility, but that's a corporate responsibility as well that I must function. We're members of one another. You cannot distinguish. Uh, so we lay aside falsehood because falsehood would not only be detrimental to me, it would be detrimental for you. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sin go down on your wrath. Um, verse 26, remember we mentioned there are 41 commands given in the Greek text of Ephesians. One of those commands is given in the first three chapters. Forty of those commands are given in the last three chapters. Uh, chapters 4, 5, and 6 have 40 of the 41 because he's talking about how you implement this, how this ought to be lived out in your life. Uh, the first three chapters he talked about the basics that what has happened to us in Christ. But now, how do we live? And here's what you must do. And in verses 26 to 32, there are 10 of these commandments given um, in this section alone. Uh, so that's more than the average of one a verse that breaks down. It's about seven verses and about 10 commandments. Uh, be angry, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. You know, there's a place for anger. We're not just to be passive, indifferent, won't. But the expectation is with other believers. Uh, we want to be angry about sin, yet we don't want to sin. And part of that is we don't let the sun go down on our wrath. You'll note, as you have it put up out, if you're using the New American Standard Bible, be angry and do not sin come from Psalm chapter 4, verse 4. And Paul weaves that in um, because it is consistent with what the Old Testament says, even though the bulk of his audience came out of a background where they didn't know the Old Testament. But they had to learn the Old Testament because that is the Word of God. And it is consistent, even though there is a change now that he's not dealing with the nation Israel, he's dealing with the church, there's still application that comes from the truths of the Old Testament. So be angry. We're angry about sin. We're angry about sin and other believers. Uh, we're angry about falsehood. Uh, but be careful that doesn't lead us to sin. That's self-righteous. I mean, the Jewish leaders of Jesus' day that we read about, for example, in uh, John chapter 8, they would not thought, oh, yes, sex outside of marriage, that is wrong. Um, you know, homosexuality, that is contrary to God's will and all these things. But they were themselves not in right relationship with God. They were not saved by grace through faith. They were just, and that's true, sadly, of the bulk of what are called churches today. They just basically use the Bible, but it's not that which really transforms the heart 
in the life. Be angry, do not sin. And don't let the sin go down on your anger. Uh, so I have to, uh, that's right, be angry with sin. Uh, but uh, don't sin. Don't let that fester. Uh, go to sleep. I'm having a hard time sleeping. I finally get to sleep, but the next day, that's all right. I haven't forgotten. I remember. Wait a minute. Now I am in sin. And the days go on. Pretty soon that becomes a fixed way of my thinking. And then it's hard to tell whether we're dealing with a believer any longer or an unbeliever. I mean, he says, don't let the sin go down on your anger. You're angry about sin, but I have first to be concerned about my own sin. Then I got to be careful. My view of what someone else is doing doesn't become an excuse for my sin. So be angry. Do not sin. I mean, yes, there may be falsehood. We have to deal with that. We have church discipline and the steps laid out in Matthew and so on. But I want to be careful that uh, that doesn't carry over and carry over. Uh, it's sin for me to wake up in the morning. Yeah, I, I still I can't get all really upset about that. Wait a minute. Uh, I got to get right with the Lord. Uh, do not let the sin go down on your anger. Do not give the devil an opportunity, a place. Um, you know, you fail to deal with sin. You allow the devil to get a hold. And now he can let that fester. It doesn't this have to do with anything here. I don't have to do anything. I'm just thinking about it. Well, you know how that goes. And pretty soon over the week, then it becomes a settled part. Come over to... Uh, Ephesians chapter 6, we'll get here, but the Lord may come. So chapter 6, verse 10, Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you'll be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly. So take up the... Uh, full armor of God. Stand firm, verse 14. Uh, take the helmet of salvation, verse 17. I have to be careful. Because the devil just sort of, uh, well, yeah, you know, that's not right. And I don't think they've treated you right. And I don't think they, yeah. Yeah, and I don't think the elders are handling it right. Or I don't think this believer is handling it right. And pretty soon this is festering and it's become my own sin. And I become, I've got a block there because I've got my sin and it is supposedly caused by your sin. But I can't deal with your sin because now I've got my own sin. And so really the instruction is uh, don't give the devil, verse 27, an opportunity, a place, literally. Don't give him a place. Don't give him a little room that then he can begin to work. I, I realize it's sin. Maybe another person is doing wrong. They're brought up falsehood. Um, we're supposed to speak the truth. We are members of one another. But I have to be careful that I don't let that. I can't change that person. I just have to be careful, number one, about me. If I do talk to them, if I do think it's scriptural that I do, I talk to them with the right attitude. I talk to them with the right uh, goal. Otherwise, I'm entangled. I want to tell you about something and you're doing this wrong. And wait a minute. That's not even consistent with the steps that we have of uh, dealing with a professing believer in Matthew 18. I want to come and say, you know, I, I can understand your struggle here. I, I want to be a help. No, I want to, you know, so... Don't give the devil a place. Simple thing for us as believers. One thing we want to learn when we're now walking as new people in Christ. I don't want to give the devil a place. A little room in my heart to cause that to fester and it will grow. Then pretty soon I'm so upset about your sin, I don't realize, wait a minute, has become an occasion for me to get into sin. Which is no excuse before God because he already told me. Don't 
be angry overnight. Hmm. Yeah, but you don't know what they did. You don't know. No, I just know what God said. And that's what you do. And that's what we are all working on. He who steals, he comes now to some practical application. Uh, stealing, well, wait a minute. That's, oh, of course, stealing is bad. I mean, we were talking before about anger over sin. Yeah, but it's all part of the flesh. I've been made new in Christ. So it's not different. He who steals must steal no longer. Well, what's the solution? I'm, I need it. Work. He must labor, toil to exhaustion, performing with his own hands what is good. And to do that so he has something to share with someone who has need. So maybe that person stole from me. I say, well, wait a minute. That's wrong. But I understand, you know, you're, you're under pressure, you're under need. I've been working. I have some here. Let me share with you. Um, stealing's never an answer. And for us as believers, we want to help believers not be in a position where they feel I don't have any choice if I don't do. And stealing's a broad concept here. You know, we can steal by cheating on our income tax. And if I don't cheat a lot... I'll just fudge it a little or other ways it all comes into that umbrella I was uh, audited on my taxes many years ago and I was glad and I was glad that when they did they said they owed me money and I said well that was good after I gave everything and all the stuff and all they said yeah we owe you didn't uh, claim as much if I'm going to have any question I'd rather have it that way now, that doesn't mean sometimes they don't, you know, there's misunderstandings. And, but this concludes all kind of dishonesty. He who steals must steal no longer. He must labor. Well, I have to, I have to work with my hands. I, I mean, I have to work harder. I may have to work longer. That's part of what the result of the fall is, remember. By the sweat of our brow. We, you know, we live in a society where you should be able to get but not work for what you get. And the more the government says that, the more we say, well, yeah, to, we want to be careful that that doesn't begin to affect our thinking. And uh, then we begin to become adjusted and we begin to support Paul. You know, in one sense, he's living under Roman authority. In another sense, he's not. He's about his own business. Now he's living consistent. He gives instruction that we obey those who have the authority over us. But within that, I'm doing everything we got. When it finally comes, you can't, I can't uh, serve God and man. Uh, then I'll pay the consequence. Um, so yeah, I'm willing. Well, the government, well, I don't think they're taking more than they deserve. Of course they are. Jesus dealt with that as well as some of the New Testament passages. The taxes are always more than they should be from our perspective. But that's what it is. So if that's the law, I obey the law. Um, so there is the balance here. But uh, he who steals must steal no longer. He must labor with his and perform with his own hands what is good so he'll have something to share with those who have need. Not just to meet my need. But maybe now the Lord's given me, I don't just necessarily always move up. Maybe it's the Lord's given me extra so I can give extra. So I could be ready to help somebody else in need. Because really what I have here isn't that important. And that doesn't mean we all have to go down and live as, you know, the poorest of the poor. Uh, but we just want to be careful. And I do want to live below what I might be able to live if I wasn't giving. I mean, enough said. Let no unwholesome word. Now, it seems like, well, you go with falsehood and anger, and then you go with stealing. And then in verse 29, you go with back to your words. Because Paul, you'll find this. We found it in our study of Romans where he elaborates you just these all get milk, uh, woke, uh, worked out together. They're interwoven. Sin is sin. 
I say, well, I may not be perfect here, but at least I don't do this. That's why the scripture just sort of puts all these things in a mixture and stirs them up. Because what I do with my mind, I know, but nobody's perfect. So, uh, yeah, I lose my temper, but I don't steal. Well, wait a minute. It puts me in the same category, the same kind of person uh, who's living like the old man. Whether it's with my lips, whether it's stealing. Uh, well, I, yeah, but we, we have more severe penalties for stealing than we do with lying. Yes, but God's looking at us as we manifesting his character. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. It's literally a rotten word. You have in the margin, it's a word, and it can come to mean unwholesome, uh, but it, it has the whole range. Proceed from your mouth. Only is it good for edification, according to the need. We have of the moment added here. So they may give grace to those who hear. That's what I want to do. I want to provide the kind of thing that will be an encouragement and a help to a believer. And that goes back to verse on uh, verse 25. I want to lay aside speaking falsehood. I want to remember we're members of one another. I don't want the sin to go down to my anger. I don't want to steal and take from people. I don't want unwholesome words. I want words that are profitable, that are helpful, that are good for edification. Um, and you'll note here, it's a singular. Let, verse 29, let no unwholesome word. It doesn't say words. Word. I want to be careful with what I say. Uh, in particular, we're talking about speech to un other believers because it's for their edification. I want to be careful. It's easy to jump in and I see something, I want to jump in and deal with it. Oh, wait a minute. That's where I don't let the sun go down on my anger. And maybe I ought to wait till tomorrow to talk to that person about it. And first I ought to be sure I'm not angry over perhaps how it affected me or how it's affected someone close to me or something like that. Their sin. Uh, I want to be careful here. A word proceed from your mouth. But only that is good for edification according to the need of the moment gives you the idea. So that we'll give grace to those who hear. That's the primary thing. God, I see that there is uh, something that could be adjusted, corrected in this person's life. But I want to handle it in a way that will bring honor to you. I don't want to come across as judging them as, yeah, I'm, I wouldn't do that. Therefore, no, maybe I'll wait till tomorrow. And maybe I'll concentrate on first being sure that I've got myself together. And I'm where I ought to be and where I want to be. Uh, otherwise, we're, and pretty soon you can't tell the church from the unbeliever. Because we're, you know, going after one another. Uh, doesn't mean we don't have to address sin. We want to be careful. It doesn't become our sin that compounds their sin. And now it just snowballs. Uh, it will give grace to those who hear. Um, that's what we want. Uh, verse 30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And... Uh, this is similar, we'll go back to Isaiah 63. We've not been going back to these passages, but uh, Isaiah 63, if you don't want to go there, just listen. <laughs> but they rebelled, 63.10. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Therefore he turned himself to become their enemy and fought against them. You want to be careful here. Um, they rebelled and grieved the Holy Spirit. Uh, now God becomes their enemy. Um, so I want to be careful here in my action that I'm not functioning as an unbeliever would function or using my Christianity as an excuse. Because yes, of course I'm better than them. I never did that. I, I, I just have to talk to them about that. Well, 
Sleep on it. Uh, make sure when you wake up, your attitude is right. You're right before the Lord. And what I really want to do is help them grow through this. Not put them down for what they're doing as much as help them grow. Uh, for edification. According to the need of the moment. It will give grace to those who hear. Uh, so, do not grieve. And the word, <clears throat> verse 30 begins with the word, uh, the word and. And do not grieve. Because it connects to what he has just said. Uh, about not, let, not letting an uh, unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. He talked about this sealing in chapter 1, verse 13. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believed, you were sealed in him with the Spirit, Holy Spirit of promise, who's given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession of the praise uh, of his glory. I don't want to grieve the Spirit who dwells within me. That has to do with our relationship with one another he's talking about. I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. I don't want to make him unhappy with me, so to speak, as the scripture says. Uh, when I'm doing something that's contrary to his word, I'm grieving him. I'm causing him pain, um, sorrow. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. This is the one by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. I mean, uh, it's what verses 13 and 14 of chapter 1, as we have this letter, talked about what the Spirit has done for me. Uh, worthless words hurt uh, the fellow believer. Verse 29, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. So... I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. I mean, he sealed me. He's guaranteed my redemption. Uh, I want to be careful and function accordingly. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander. I mean, those five things. We could spend time on each one, but you can do that. Uh, all those things which are contrary to me being a new creature in Christ. I've laid aside the old self. I've put on the new self, so I'm being made new. Verses 22, 23, and 24. Um, in the spirit of my mind. So let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander be put away, along with all malice. Uh, all malice. All kinds of words that hurt other believers and grieve the Holy Spirit. I don't want anything to do with them. Uh, I want to be careful. So you see an emphasis on words here because James talks about this. Uh, you know, we, our words just get out. And we say things. And we, we feel, I'll feel better if I just get it off my mind. But then how often after we get it off our mind and we've thought about it for a day or two, we go back and say, and I want to apologize how I approached that. And it wasn't necessarily that what you said was wrong, but why you said it and how you said it wasn't for their edification. It was just to show how harmful and hurtful and wrong they were. Wait a minute. Let's let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander be put away from you with all malice, all, all, you note the emphasis on all there. Verse 31, all bitterness, wrath, anger, all malice, the end of the verse. And then anything you could put there and he's, our speech and then our action that go with our speech, let's put them all away from us. We're new in Christ. So, and he's talking about our relationship with one another. It's not that, well, then it's okay to do this if the person's an unbeliever. No, it's not. It's not all right to steal from someone who's not a believer. We just don't steal from fellow believers. He's starting where at home with our family. Be kind to one another, verse 32. Tenderhearted, forgiving each other just as God in Christ has forgiven you. Forgive as you're forgiven. 
And, you know, the word there is grace. Show grace as you've been shown grace. Forgiveness would be included, and uh, it's included in the parallel passage in uh, Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. He uses the word for forgiven. But here he uses the word for grace. I just want you to remember that. Be gracious to each other, just as God in Christ has been gracious to you. Forgiveness is included, but it's broader than that. Um, It's more encompassing than that. Back up to Ephesians chapter 2 as we close. Look at verse 4 of Ephesians 2. After talking about how we formerly walked, we were just like the sons of disobedience. The end of verse 2, that had the devil directing them. We all lived formerly in the lust of the flesh. We were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But verse 4, but God, rich in his mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, when we were dead in our transgressions, He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Raised us up with him. Seated us with him in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. So that in the grace, the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ. For by grace you have been saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not as a result of work so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's it. It's all by grace. So we ought to be manifesting that grace in all that we do. And that includes with those who sin, those who sin against us. I understand. It's not that sin is acceptable. But God's grace is greater than your sin. It's greater than my sin. And so we appreciate the fact that we are kind to one another, tenderhearted, showing grace to each other because it's just as God in Christ has shown grace to us. We show that same grace to others and we're helping one another to grow in our new life in Christ. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for the riches of your grace, the riches of a grace that has been shown to each and every one of us individually and personally as we have placed our faith in Christ, and a grace that continues throughout our life. Lord, may we show that grace to one another, regardless of what they might do or not do, the shortcomings, the failures, the sins. Lord, may they not become personal issues with us but we may we first go back and consider what you have done for us and then be ready and willing to show that grace to those who are still growing we ask this in Christ's name amen